What a joy it is to welcome you into worship at Central Church. I'm Sharon Withers, pastor of Congregational Care. And on behalf of Pastor Kim and myself, we just invite you that if you have a prayer request that you would just email that to us or give us a call, let us know how you're doing. We do not want to ignore you or to let you think that you are abandoned because you're not. You are terribly missed. In fact, instead of counting weeks to see how long it's been since we've been together, we're counting months now. This next Tuesday will be three months. We could not have imagined this ordeal lasting so long, but it has. But from the Growing Deeper that is going out on Wednesdays on the email, we're hearing that people, testimonies from people that they are seeing God in new ways, are taking more time to be with Him. And we just pray that that's your situation as well, that you're seeing new ways to worship or just experiencing God's love for you. Well, today, Pastor Kim, he's going to start a brand new series. It's on the three simple rules. And this is taken from John Wesley's ministry when he started the Methodist Church. So stay tuned. Holly and James are going to lead us into worship. Please join me in singing, Be Thou My Vision. you into prayer this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning we praise you. You are our God. We are your people. Your unshakable love surrounds us. In describing yourself to Moses, you said, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Father, how we need to remember your character this day. For you are the one who gives us hope. You lead us into truth. Your loving kindness is powerful and draws us ever closer to you. You forgive our sins and you set us free. Help us this morning to cling to you, to hunger for more of you. As we encounter the world and our nation, there are so many voices and opinions and threats that seem to jar our senses as to what is right and what's wrong. But today we reaffirm our faith. We stand on your word, not afraid to be your ambassadors. Father, wherever we are and in various situations we face, help us to cling to Jesus. May we envision grabbing the hem of his robe and experiencing the power of his love flowing into us. 
as we move into our community and society, may we bring your hope, your love, your truth to a nation that needs you more than ever. Father, this morning I pray for our church family. Be close to those who live alone, giving them wisdom and protection. Be with those who are separated from loved ones or extended family and unite them by your grace. Be with those families who are stuck together and perhaps needing a break from each other, that they might find solace and comfort as they seek your patience and discretion. Father, today, we, your people, help us to bring unity into a world that needs you as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you this day. Good morning and welcome to online worship at Central Church here in Richland, Washington. Well, we're delighted to have you with us today. If you have a prayer request, if you'd like to chat with me, if you'd like to ask questions about the sermon, I can be reached at kimf at cupchurch.org. Well, you know what next week is, don't you? That's right. Next week is Father's Day, which gives rise to that age old question, which is, well, what do fathers want for Father's Day? We're not easy to buy things for. So, so let me share with you, as a father and as a grandfather, some of the things that I would really like for Father's Day. I would like a donut. Which means that, that I am missing the fact that we are not going to have donuts for Dad next week. I suppose most of my wishes aren't all that healthy because I like a thick hamburger and a thick chocolate milkshake. But you know what I'd really like? Above all, I would like this world to be a better place. When I had children, I, I began to wish that the world was a better place for them. And now that I have grandchildren, now that I'm a grandfather of six, I really want a better world. A better world for my grandkids. But as I look around, it's hard to see how this world is headed in anything but a worse direction. Well, which brings me to the topic for this morning. It's rules. I, I feel that we can't get there, that we can't build a better world for my grandkids, the world that they need without the right sorts of rules to guide our behavior. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not and never have been a, a big fan of rules. I suppose that you might say that I'm somewhat of a libertarian. I feel that the best government is the government that governs least. Personally, I try to mind my own business and I like it when others mind their business too. I suppose it, it just comes naturally. I mean, most of us who live in this part of the West live here because we have ambivalent feelings when it, when it comes to rules. Likely our ancestors moved West because they were tired of rules, because they didn't get along well with others. Suspicion of rules is baked into our very genes. But that said, we live in a world of rules. We live in a world that needs rules. The, the world, our culture, our nation, our conference, our, our families, they, they all have rules. It's become very apparent since the COVID crisis. Not long ago, the, the governor sent an ebook of rules that have to be adhered to if we want to reopen our building. 
The conference sent us another book. Rolls, rolls, rolls. Did I mention that, that I really don't much like rules? However, if I'm honest, I have to admit that rules are necessary. Well, without rules, people tend towards anarchy. Rules are designed to prevent that. Well, we've seen in recent weeks the, the chaos that happens when we don't adhere to rules. Without rules, Without people obeying rules, society breaks down. And so we have both civil and criminal rules. Break a civil law and it costs you a lot of money. Break a criminal law and you might wind up in jail. Speaking of criminal law, have you heard the, the story about the state trooper who positioned himself alongside the highway to, to catch speeders when they went by? Before long, he noticed a car puttering along at barely 22 miles an hour. He thought to himself, this driver is just as dangerous as any speeder. So he turned on his lights, he headed out and he, he pulled the car over. As he approached the car, he noticed that there were five old ladies in the car, two in the front seat and three in the back. They, they were wide eyed and white as ghosts. The driver rolled down her window and obviously confused protested oh, officer i don't understand i was going exactly the speed limit so what seems to be the problem ma'am the officer replied you weren't speeding but you should know that driving slower than the speed limit can be just as dangerous to other drivers well, which led the woman to protest again slower than, than the speed limit no, sir, I was going exactly the speed limit, exactly 22 miles an hour, just like the sign said. The state trooper tried not to chuckle as he explained to her that the 22 was the highway's number, not the speed limit. Embarrassed, the, the woman thanked the officer for pointing out the error. Before the officer left, though, he, he said, ma'am, I need to ask you, is everyone okay? Those other women seem to be awfully shaken. Oh, they'll be all right, officer, said the woman. I, I think the trouble is that we just got off Route 119. Sometimes it's hard to know what is right, to know just what we should do in a given situation, well, which is why it helps to have rules. We need rules, simple rules, clear rules, rules to guide us. Without rules and without people willing to follow those rules, society breaks down. We have disobedience, riots, chaos. Like I said, I am not a big fan of rules, but, but I know that we need rules. We need rules that the people obey, that the people respect. The evidence of, of what happens when we don't respect rules is all around us. There is so much incivility, so much anger. People are, are focused on their differences, not, not on seeking common ground. And entrenchment and argument have replaced listening. The, the need to be right has overcome love and compassion. And, and I know, I know from personal experience how easy it is to get sucked into those futile arguments. To, to not be the person I want to be or live the desire that I, that I want to live. However, I believe that most of us are tired of, of living that way. With that we long for a way to cut through the anger and incivility of our world, to somehow be part of building a, a better, more loving world for our children and for our grandchildren. Wouldn't it be great if we could be part of the solution instead of part of the problem? To, to find a way to bring people together, to overcome hostility and disrespect that they really only leave us wounded and incomplete. But how can we do that? Well, where do we turn for help? As Christians, we naturally turn to the one who created us and loves us just as we are and yet seeks to help us become better human beings. Thankfully, Jesus had something to say about this. When asked when, 
when when he was asked which role is the greatest, which is the most important, he he was clear. His answer was simple. He said, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then he added, you should also love your neighbor as you love yourself. In those simple words, we find the foundation on which to build a better world. Jesus' words were simple. They were clear. We are called first to love God and then to love neighbor. We've heard that, we get that, we understand that. But understanding it is easier than actually living it out. Following Jesus' simple rule is difficult. Sadly, most of us don't do a very good job of living it out. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I think we want to. I doubt if many of us are happy with the way things are right now. Most of us probably never imagined that we live in such a divided world. I know my father, who, who lived through World War II, was hopeful that our world would find a way to come together in peace and harmony and plenty for all. The sacrifices that he and his generation made were so enormous that they could hardly imagine we would ever permit ourselves to become so divided again. But we find ourselves living in a world where divisions seem to grow deeper each day. Now, now maybe it was naive of him to expect that we would grow closer and more loving as we became better educated and shared in more of the world's riches. I don't know where things went astray. Perhaps we forgot the struggles and sacrifices of, of those who came before us. Maybe we grew complacent, be, began to take community too lightly and individualism too seriously, to neglect the clear commands of Jesus. Sadly, for whatever reason, the world of peace and plenty my father dreamed of never came about. Instead of growing better, we, we grew further and further apart. Nations are growing more and more hostile. People are more divided. And indeed, we see deepening divisions within our own nation, our own state, even our own community and family. And religion, we seem to have forgotten Jesus' prayer from, from John. Jesus spoke. My, my prayer is not for them alone. I, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How is the world to know that Jesus is Lord? Jesus said that they will know because of our unity in Christ. Yet as I look around, it's hard to see much unity. There are so many divisions even within Christianity. Each one of us is sure that we have a firm grip on the truth that the others are missing. Even within denominations, even within congregations, there are divisions over doctrine and what constitutes faithful discipleship and sin. Even our own families, even my family, have become divided by squabbles, disagreements, and the pressures of surviving in an, in an increasingly competitive culture. Is it any wonder that, that many question the point of the church and asking, is that the way God's people should live? If, if the Christians are as divided and angry as the rest of society, then what's the point? Why have anything to do with it? Indeed, some of us are asking similar questions within the church, asking, is this any way for Christians to live? That's the question I would like us to ponder this morning. I want us to ask, are we measuring up to our calling as children of God? 
Are we building a better world for our children and grandchildren? If we're not, is there a better way for us to practice our faith? A way that is simple and clear, which can guide us as we seek to live in ways that are both faithful and apparent to those around us. Ways that will help us to live out Jesus' prayer from John, where he said, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus asks us to live as one, which reminds me, I really would like us to continue the practice of memorizing a scripture verse each week, a verse that we can carry with us to provide us with hope and, and maybe even shape the way we live our lives. How better to live than to seek to be one, even as Jesus and the Father are one. To, to model love and unity in a, in a deeply, deeply divided world. Which is why I'd like to ask you to memorize John 17, 11. Would you read it with me? Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Is that something you desire? Do you yearn for oneness in Christ? Can you think of a better witness in this deeply divided world than, than to live lives of unity and oneness in Christ? Do you want to live so that when others look at us, they see God at work in our lives together? Think about it. What would, be, what would it be like to live in ways that are life-giving rather than life-draining? Is it even possible to do that? Personally, I can't help but believe that those of us who claim Jesus Christ as our Savior also believe in the possibility of living in the way that Jesus calls us to. Most of us yearn to live good, faithful lives in Christ. We want to be faithful to the, the highest life we know. But how? How do we go about doing that? One tool that has helped many Christians, at least many of us who come from the Methodist tradition, to sort through the practical issues of life and decide how to live in a complex world is a tool that was handed down by, by John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. Wesley lived in a time not, not unlike our own. He was called to preach in a time of rapid change and growing secularism. The Industrial Revolution was transforming British society. Large factories had replaced individual craftsmen. It wasn't long before the cheap factory pro products bankrupted many village craftsmen, forcing them to travel into the cities to, to, to seek work to find employment. London and the other major cities grew rapidly. Housing was soon in short supply. Sprung, slums sprung up everywhere and, and hygiene became impossible. Disease was rampant. One study claims that infant mortality rate, rates reached 75%. There were far more deaths than births, and only rapid migration from the countryside enabled London and the other major cities to keep from losing population. Riots occurred. Churches disagreed with one another, sometimes violently over theology. And the new immigrants, far from the support of family and home church, strayed from God, turning to alcoholism and drugs and sexual promiscuity. As I said, it was a time much like our own. John Wesley preached in that time. He felt called by God to reach those who were lost, who had, who had abandoned God and church, who, who had strayed from Christ, and bring them back to God, to help them to live holy and productive lives. He, he called his followers to live lives that set them apart from the rest of society. And he offered them three simple rules to help them to live in that way. His rules were simple, clear guides to living in unity, to loving God and loving neighbor. I know that personally, I found those rules to be helpful, even transforming when I practiced them. What were Wesley's three simple rules? They were to first, do no harm. 
Second, do good. And third, stay in love with God. John Wesley was asking how he and others in the society could live good and holy lives that stood as a witness to the power and the goodness of Christ. He was fully aware that one could have all the structures and systems right, that one could go to church, that one could even read and believe the Bible, but lose the power of God that translates into living faithfully as disciples. Wesley was determined to foster the disciplined practices that would lead to, to living in the way of Jesus, to living as disciples. And he outlined those practices in what he called the general rules. He then asked his class leaders to instruct their small group members in them and hold them accountable to them. History tells us that these three simple rules gave new life to the men and women who responded to Wesley's call to follow Christ. Those rules set them on a path that became a movement which formed a denomination through which millions came to Christ. I believe that these three simple rules are just as relevant, maybe more relevant today than they were when Wesley penned them so long ago. Let me share them again. They are one, do no harm, two, do good, and three, stay in love with God. Wesley's rules were simple. They, they were clear and they are in keeping with our mission. I mean, think about it. The mission of Central Church is to make disciples by loving people and leading them to Christ. So then how are disciples to live? How, how are we to witness to others? How are we to stand out from society? Well, one description would be the disciples are followers of Jesus who live out his commandments by doing no harm, doing good, and staying in love with God. As we seek to navigate an increasingly hostile, uncivil world, as we seek to live lives of unity that the witness to a divided society, I thought that these rules might be useful tools to have in our toolkit. Who knows, maybe with God's help, the witness of our lives as we live these things out can begin to transform not only ourselves, but our church and even our community. Heaven knows we all need transformation. And so over the next three weeks, I will do my best to unpack each of these rules, asking how we might apply them to our lives and in ways that help us to live in unity giving life to Christ's prayer, the one we're memorizing this week. You remember it. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I don't know about you, but as a father and as a grandfather, what I want is a better world, a more caring world, a more godly world for my children and especially for my grandchildren. I want a world where people do their best not to harm others, to do good, and to fall more deeply in love with God. I hope you join me over the next three weeks as we seek to move into that vision together. May we be one, even as God and Christ are one. Make us pure and righteous, make us.
us holy, make us pure, make us pure, for the sake of your name, make us pure, make us one, make us one, make us one, undivided body. Make us one, make us one, for the sake of your name, make us one, for the sake of your name, till you come, for the sake of your name, make us one. Go out this week, live lives of unity. Be, be a witness to the divided world around you. My prayer is that we may be one, even as Christ and God are one. And all God's people said, Hallelujah!